Hey, welcome back to the Full Count Podcast. We have Sway back on here, our analytics guy when it comes to baseball. So thank you for coming back on, Sway. Hey, glad to be back. It's been a few months, but Daddy's back. We have some baseball to talk about. Uh, yes. Big news in L.A., but we'll let Andrew lead us into our, our intro here. Yeah, so uh, exciting time for baseball, considering it was like the, the two behemoths in terms of branding for baseball being New York and L.A., and uh, – it was incredible to see the most like strongest players in terms of hitting wise, Aaron Judge and Shohei Otani, you know, go bat to bat and see who wins. But it was a bit odd because they both weren't as um, as performative as they normally are, right? But what we did see with the Dodgers, and I really liked, and I would like to hear your thoughts on this, is the Dodgers close knit type team was amazing, considering what Max Muncie said about. Um, once they went into the postseason, they had five days off and they basically spent all that time together taking a, a huge break within that five gap. Um, do you think, Sway, that that really put them over the edge considering they won the World Series? You know, the past few years with uh, the addition of the new wild card round, mm-hmm. that's been like the Achilles heel for those teams is that taking those five days off, sitting, waiting, seeing who you're going to play. I think the Dodgers have learned from those mistakes, and I think this is something that everyone's kind of learned this this past postseason. The Phillies did what, or I shouldn't say the Phillies, but more teams advanced, the higher seed teams advanced than the previous years, mm. because I think they're taking a different approach and learn from the mistakes of playoff teams in the past. So I think the Dodgers did it right. Uh, I know years before they were doing simulated games with the crowd. Right. at Dodger Stadium, of uh, music and that kind of stuff. But I feel like when you spend that time with the team, you you form those bonds, you become brothers. And, and the Dodgers took that to another level and just like, hey, we're going to play a game regardless. We know the fundamentals. Let's just share this time together and see what develops from that. And I think they did it right, obviously. The fact that they had like the pool tables together, they had catering. Uh, Max Muncy was really talking it up. And I think you have a good point because the simulated games and having fans come in is one thing, but when you're able to, you know, kind of embrace your, the brotherhood amongst each other, I think that, that really goes, goes out. But one, one thing I did notice between the Yankees and the Dodgers, I might be wrong. I, I didn't look at the ages, but the Dodgers are more, um, they're, they're men in terms of like, they're in their late twenties or early thirties. And I felt like a lot of the Yankees were in their mid 20s or early 20s and i think that kind of hurt them a little bit because the maturity on the dodgers was a bit better yeah you may be right but that's a good sign for yankees fans is you have a young core of guys that could eventually lead you to a world series uh whereas like the dodgers are matured and they're going to contend every year and every year but baseball is so unpredictable you just never know what's going to happen right. and i think that's a cool thing about the yankees with the exception of garrett cole He's probably, what, 33, 34. Um, the Yankees' contention window is open regardless of whether they retain Soto or not. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, particularly, too, though, with the Yankees, I think a lot of them are not going to be back on the team uh, because of uh, their performance. Some of them wasn't great, like Labor Torres, until postseason. He killed it. But I don't think he's coming back a second baseman because of the issue, right, of what we saw in the World Series. The fundamentals on the Yankees was not great. I think that's what lost a lot of their ability to win. Uh, like in my in my opinion, game one they had in the bag. This last game that they lost, they had in the bag, but they ruined it with errors. What do you think? Yeah, you're right. And we'll we'll talk about Torres. Torres has had a tumultuous relationship with the Yankees. It's up and down. They either love him or hate him, and it's always like this. I think they part ways with Torres. I think he's a free agent, right? Mm-hmm. I think so, yeah. Okay, so yeah. if he is, I don't anticipate him Jazz Shizzle being will re-signed. Probably get it. But um, mm-hmm. what were we just saying about the other part? Sorry. Um, no, what, what was what was special Torres? What was special about Torres is the bad thing was he would always make mistakes at second base, errors, terrible errors too, or he wouldn't run fast enough to catch a fly ball in the infield, and he would drop it. He he looked like he was trying to do like some type of trick you know, make it like impressive and then he would drop it. So we saw that throughout the season, but what made him so great was he always kind of came through when we needed him at bat. He would hit home runs in the postseason. He really excelled, but other players really dropped the ball and just were not doing so well. Like those three errors in game five. Yeah. Yeah. And second base is a real hard position to find someone of power, someone that's going to 
driving RBIs. They're, they're better off getting mm-hmm. someone else at second base. And I think they'll find that in free agency or through trades. Um, but at the same time, you got some some pretty good infielders. What's his name? Osvaldo, something young kid, Cabrera. Cabrera. He looks like he could be a potential superstar in a year or two. I would love to plug him in as a regular everyday player. Um, yeah, I think I think we should like move Jazz name Shizzle in the World Series. I I don't feel like a lot of people knew him Volpe. prior to the World Series. Now he might be a household mm-hmm. name. Yeah. Did you say Volpe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been he's only twenty three, and um, he hit that grand slam mm-hmm. I think in Game Four. That was pretty crazy. I mean, Freddie Freeman had his moment. This guy had his moment too, uh, with the grand slam. Um, but, uh, I think, I think it was great. Um, but the fundamentals really screwed him up. Unfortunately. Um, I can read this really like quick excerpt from uh, sports illustrated. This is what they were saying about the, the errors in the games. And I'm going to pause real quick. Yeah, you may be right, but that's a good sign for Yankees fans is you have a young core of guys that could eventually lead you to a world series. Uh, Whereas like the Dodgers are matured and they're going to contend every year and every year, but baseball's so unpredictable. You just never know what's going to happen. And I think that's a cool thing about the Yankees with the exception of Garrett Cole, who's probably what, 33, 34. Um, the Yankees contention window is open regardless of whether they retain Soto or not. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, particularly too, though, with the Yankees, I think a lot of them are not going to be back on the team. Uh, because of uh, the performance, some of them wasn't great, like Labor Torres until postseason. He killed it, but I don't think he's coming back a second baseman because of the issue, right, of what we saw in the World Series. The fundamentals on the Yankees was not great. I think that's what lost a lot of their ability to win. Uh, like, in my, in my opinion, game one they had in the bag. This last game that they lost, they had in the bag, but they ruined it with errors. What do you think? Yeah, you're right. And we'll, we'll talk about Torres. Torres has had a tumultuous relationship with the Yankees. It's up and down. They either love him or hate him, and it's always like this. I think they part ways with Torres. I think he's a free agent, right? I think so, yeah, yeah. The bad thing was he would always make mistakes at second base. Errors, terrible errors, too. Or he wouldn't run fast enough to catch a fly ball in the infield, and he would drop it. He, he looked like he was trying to do like some type of trick you know, make it like impressive and then he would drop it. So we saw that throughout the season, but what made him so great was he always kind of came through when we needed him at bat. He would hit home runs in the postseason. He really excelled, but other players really dropped the ball and just were not doing so well. Like those three errors in game five. Yeah. Yeah. And second base is a real hard position to find someone of power or someone that's going to drive in RBIs. They're better off getting someone else at second base. And I think they'll find that in free agency or through trades. But at the same time, you got some some pretty good infielders. What's his name? Osvaldo, something young kid. Cabrera. Cabrera. He looks like he yeah. could be a potential superstar in a year or two. I would love to plug him in as a regular everyday player. Um, I think Volpe made his name like a household name in the World Series. I, I don't feel like a lot of people knew him. Prior to the World Series, now he might be a household name. Yeah, he's been. He's only twenty three. And um, he hit that grand slam, I think, in game four. That was pretty crazy. I mean, Freddie Freeman had his moment. This guy had his moment, too, uh, with the grand slam. Uh, but uh, I, think, I think it was great. Um, but the fundamentals really screwed him up, unfortunately. Um, I can read this really like quick excerpt from uh, Sports Illustrated. This is what they were saying about the, the errors in the games. Game one, for example, I didn't even pick this up by the way I just thought it was the issue with the uh, the manager of the Yankees putting in Nestor Torres at the end I thought that's what killed the game which it did but also this Shohei Otani took third base on an error credited on Juan Soto for a bad throw into second base that next batter uh, being Mookie Betts hit a sacrifice fly to center field to bring home Otani and tie the game 2-2 so even if Boone didn't do that stupid thing at the very end with Nestor Torres um, they could have probably won the, the, the Dodgers. I'm sorry, the Yankees. Um, and then in game three, the Yankees had poor base running. And I think this was the error on the coach, not the player. Um, it was on display when the not-so-speedy Giancarlo Stan, because we all know he's very slow, 
was mm. thrown out at the plate by Tio Oscar Hernandez, which was a beautiful throw. Um, and uh, then in game four, the rookie phenomenon, as you were saying, you know, he hit that grand slam, but he also failed to uh, turn a play on second base, which was not good. And then, as we all know, game five, if you want to go over those quick errors that, that the Yankees did, it would be great. Yeah, I've never seen an inning like that in, in my life in baseball, let alone the postseason or the World Series. Judge is almost a lock for an easy pop-up like that. You and I could have handled that pretty easily, I, I feel like. Yeah. But I was telling my wife, like, during, during this whole World Series and situations like that, is, like, the teams of destiny take advantage of situations like that. And then each opportunity they did, they, they came through. So there came that. He missed that catch. Uh, Rizzo didn't go to first. What what else? That throw from from Vol was it Volpe to Chisholm mm -hmm. at third base where he didn't get Kiki in time. Like those things just kept opening the door, and the Dodgers kept taking advantage and taking advantage. Right. And that's why I was saying, like, hey, the teams that are that go down as legends, that go down as World Series champions, take advantage and come through in situations like that. And, and there was plenty of times where hey, there's bases loaded, runners on base. Like say for example, Teoscar Hernandez hit that double off the wall in Game Five which pretty much got us back into that game. I think that's when it, they tied it 5-5. Five to five. Those are the moments you live for as a player where you go down in history, and, and they did it, and they did it. But they, those things wouldn't have happened if the Yankees were just focused. Hey, all, all Judge had to do was catch that fly ball, and who knows what could have happened. That would have been a game six, game seven. Maybe the, 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 the Yankees could have won the World Series. Who, who knows what could have happened if they would have just made those plays. Right. Yeah, there was a scouting. I, I don't even know why I didn't even think of this, but the Dodgers had scouting to check out the Yankees' performance, and they were able to like track everything and tell the Dodgers, here's their weak points. And it said that um, uh, that Yankees are t are talent over fundamentals. Uh, they run they run. So he told the Dodgers, run bases with aggression, just get the ball in play, and they're going to make errors because they will self inflict harm, as shown by. Uh, you know, every player that we already discussed. So they obviously, um, yeah, I don't know. It was not good. But I didn't even think about baseball teams having scouts checking out their their um, their rival, essentially, especially in the World Series. But that, that alone, they were saying that the outfielders were in the right position. Juan Soto was playing too, too um, in. He should have been more out because he was terrible at, at getting fly balls behind him. And then Jazz Shism would make a lot of mistakes, too, in terms of positioning. So... It's all very analytical, and Dodgers, you know, good job on your Dodgers for kicking ass, dude. dude isn't that crazy? Because every every team has their their analytics when it comes to lining up and positioning right. in the field, and they'll even they'll like you'll see they'll look in their hats and they'll see like the little paper that tells them where to shift or where to be, especially like in the in right field. Like, hey, you want to be on this spot? You want to be on this spot? It's crazy if this really happened that the Yankees didn't take advantage of stuff like that because. In 2024, cameras are everywhere. Video is everywhere. You can study everybody's exact moves. And to hear that they didn't do that, which I don't think they did, but if they didn't, I, that that's a huge, huge problem in this day and age of baseball. Yeah, I think if, maybe they were just a little too lazy or lax, maybe is a better word. And they should have – they were relying on their talent so much as their strategy, potentially. Yeah, this is what I think. I think the Yankees aren't meant for the big stage. No, really? I don't agree with that one. Oh, that's funny. They, they fold uh, under pressure. I mean, maybe maybe this the spotlight was way too big for the Yankees this time. Around. Pressure was too much. That full count moment was just too high for them. Um, yeah. The Juan Soto situation after the game when they lost, did you see how the reporters were asking him about like his next step? And he was basically saying, all 30 teams he's he's willing to essentially hear from in terms of a contract. Were you for that or against that, considering they lost that that specific day and he told the reporters that? I, I see it. I'm, I'm for it. As, as an individual player, you got to do what's best for you. His legacy is pretty much cemented. He already has a ring. Now he's going to go get the money and hopefully, like, hey, another ring comes with it. You have to do what's best for you and have no loyalty to your whatever team you played for whose season just ended. Uh, and that's probably something that Scott Boris planted in his head. It's like, hey, there's no hometown discounts. There's nothing like that. We're going to go and grab those bags full of money, bags full of gold, and then see what happens from there. 
So I think he did the right thing as a player, but you as a Yankee fan, you're probably not going to like that too much or whatever team he was playing that, that fan base is going to be like, Oh, that guy sucks, but he has to do what he has to do. But don't you think like a um, Kershaw, a judge, we can't say Shohei yet, but kind of Shohei's the next one. They're the ones that kind of ba- like the team loves them so much they become the brand. So if like for example, let's say five years ago Kershaw was to leave, or four years ago, I think people would feel a certain type of way that he's meant for the Dodgers, if that makes sense. And I feel that I don't know. Maybe Soto should consider like staying at one spot. But I understand your your point about individualistically you got to look at it in a certain way to get the most bang for your buck and make as much money as possible and not have any loyalty to any team. So I get that. But, um, did you see the, uh, Garrett Cole, like five years ago, Scott Boris was also a sports agent, uh, game seven, the Astros lost Garrett Cole was there wearing his Astro uniform, obviously. Um, but he was wearing a Scott Boris hat and basically he was basically giving a free game that he'll go anywhere. So I think you have a point about the Scott Boras agent. That's their that's their mojo, I guess. Yeah, as you should. And, and Juan Soto, he's going to be the face of a franchise wherever he goes. So he, if he's on the Blue Jays, he's going to be the face of a franchise. So he doesn't. He's probably not even thinking about that. But I do have a prediction where I think he will go. I'm saying Soto goes to the Phillies. It's. I think he has a preference for the yeah for the East Coast. The Phillies have a stacked lineup. However, that that window of contention is going to dry up in the next three or four years. And the Phillies, they absolutely 100% have to win the offseason compared to all the other teams in the league. And Soto is the way to go. And with Soto, you, hey, you have an opportunity to win. You're on the East Coast. It's a fun environment. We'll see how it plays out in a few weeks or months or whatever. But I'm saying right now, Soto to the Phillies. Okay. Okay. That's an interesting uh, prediction because I didn't really hear about that. I heard more. I think it was more. Um, I think it was more just headlines trying to get people to talk about Soto going to the Dodgers, right? What do you think about that? You think they would actually pick him up or no? I think we'll make a run for him. Well, I don't know that we'll be all in considering our our current lineup. Do we need him? No. Probably not. Would we want him? Yeah, yeah absolutely. We'll take him. Well, I, as, as we just showed that we can win the World Series without a Soto. Right, right. Okay. And then, okay, so Phillies is a good one. Uh, the Mets is another. I hear the Mets might get him. Steve, Steve Cohen, the billionaire hedge fund guy, he might just go all in and get him in. I like the Mets, too. That's another team that really has to win the offseason. Mm-hmm. And that has to start with either a Soto acquisition or – given a contract to Alonzo. If if those two don't if those two things do not happen, the Mets are are out of it. You have Lindor, you have a few other people like Vientos that, that could that are superstars. Vientos now. But they need another major, major bat. And if you have that one two punch with Alonzo and Soto, the Mets have a chance. Otherwise right. no. Right. I want to ask you about Tio Oscar Hernandez, but real quick, what's gonna to happen to Zach Neto? At the Angels, do you think he's going to stay there and play there the rest of his career, sort of like um, Trout, or no? That's a tough one because I'm sure as a player, living and playing in Orange County is great. The weather's there, the, the beach, all that kind of stuff. However, when you play for a franchise that sucks and sucks consistently, that, that has to take a toll on you. And I'm sure even with Trout, he's like, man, you know, I, I love being here. I love living, you know, looking over – living overlooking the ocean but at the same time i've never won a playoff game and that's what everyone's always going to say about me there's no chance that he wins a ring in his career unless he leaves the angels the angels are not a desirable place to play baseball right and and i think everyone's seeing that now you know 10 years ago it might have been a little bit different well a lot different because you had trout you had pool holes you had josh hamilton you had all these great players that went there and just stunk it up so yeah. people are going to pass on the Angels. He'll, he'll spend his time with the Angels and, and hopefully develop that reputation and then cash out during free agency. But I can't expect anybody to play for the Angels long term with the exception of Trout. It's just a, it's such a shitty team, such a shitty like organization. I hate to say it because – no, no, actually I say I want them to remain shitty, 
for a selfish reason because those tickets are like three dollars those tickets are like four dollars as long as they're bad and i can i could go there and take the kids there. the kids love angels games um you can't really do that with the not a great place to play it's like what the cleveland browns in baseball yeah yeah that's true uh what do you think about t oscar hernandez is he gonna get uh now he's a free agent is he staying with the dodgers or no I think the Dodgers will give him a three-year, $100 million contract, $33 million a year or so. He's not going to get a long-term deal because he's 33 years old. And this is kind of his breakout year. The year before with the Mariners, he was kind of – he was good, but not not great. And it's really – if you look historically, most people don't excel after 33 or 34 or 35. This is probably the best we'll ever see Teoscar Hernandez was in 2024 in the postseason so from a business side of it if i'm andrew friedman i'm thinking hey maybe two years 60 million dollars or something like that three years 100 million but no more than that but i do think he'll stay with the dodgers he'll find a way to do it i think i hope they do keep him because i think he brings a lot of personality um but more than likely he'll probably get a better deal is that what i'm hearing if he doesn't stay at the dodgers potentially i'm sure he's he'll take a hometown discount to stay with the dodgers he'll get Mm -hmm better offers elsewhere but i think his heart is set on coming back having another parade winning another ring um there's a thing that jose ramirez from the guardians i I hate saying the guardians i'm gonna say the indians but when he signed his 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 deal he could have probably got 50 million dollars and he said something to the fact that was like hey what's the difference between 150 million dollars and 200 million dollars you couldn't spend that money if you wanted to but i get to play where i want to play my family's right. here, blah, 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 all the other stuff he said. But in reality, like when you have that much money, it really doesn't matter. You, you couldn't spend it. Yeah. Your kids and your kids, kids, kids will be fine. That's a great point. Uh, I, I don't think Soto thinks that way. I think any any extra 10 or 50 million, he's going to take it. I think that's super important to Soto. Um, but that's a good point for why T. Oscar will probably want to stay. Um, to end on a business note, Explain to the audience who is Andrew Friedman with the Dodgers and why does everybody talk about him? Like, why do people actually care so much what he has to say? Like, is he really that great at business? He, he runs the Dodgers organization, but he, he came from like humble beginnings. He, he did the same thing with the Rays. He, he was in the front office. He developed players. He, their scouting team was top notch. They knew everything about everybody in the MLB. And then they knew that, Hey, If I found this player that the Reds cut, maybe we could take this person because they have potential. Let's let's bring them to our system. Let's develop them the way that we think is best for them and then make them into stars. And that's what he did for the Rays. Came over the Dodgers, did the same thing. Like they're like the Muncies of the world, the Chris Taylors of the world, the people that were disregarded by other teams. They've welcomed with open arms and kind of showed them like the Dodger way and just made them great, solid players. Um and, and that's what Andrew has done with the Dodgers. Four World Series appearances, two World Series titles. That's not easy to do just to make it to one World Series. But if you can have sustained success, and he's shown that he can do that, he's the best executive in baseball. And, I'll, and I'm saying this as an unbiased opinion. If Freedom was on the Giants, if Freedom was on the Yankees, I would say, like, this dude knows what he's doing. And success follows him no matter where he goes because of – his skills to identify talent, his teams, all that kind of stuff. So is he more of like an analytics analytics guy or more of an operations guy or a bit of both as an executive? Because I, I still don't really understand what the baseball executive really does. It almost sounds like – he almost sounds like uh, Billy Bean in Moneyball, the way you explained him right now. He's the president. I think he's the president of operations. I might be wrong about the title. I should know the title. Analysts and geeks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And they feed each other knowledge, and that that's where you have. But I think like he's more the operational, hey, team building, and then going from there. Okay, so it's not just the talent on the field; it's a lot of it's in the 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 actual corporate side of things. I would say it's like, hey, everybody in the MLB is talented, and otherwise they wouldn't get there. Right. But not everyone's developed the same, depending on which mm. team. They're. So I, I would be hard pressed to say that. Say, for example, the Rockies don't develop the same players the way that the Dodgers would. I think the Dodgers would get more out of, you know, if they took that lineup and just changed logos, the way that the Dodgers do it, they would get more out of those players. So in terms of development, um, you being a manager in sales and all that, would you take 
someone you can develop more, teach them the fundamentals, or would you go more with the talent? Or how would you how would you entertain that? I'm 100% coachability. You can teach everybody something mentally. As long as you have the, the fundamentals, you have the foundation, you have talent, then if you're coachable, if you can, if you can learn and take things kind of like with an open mind, you should be great in sales. Any way you can become the next executive for like the Dodgers or something? Is there any way to like actually apply to become like that or no? I'll send them my resume. I'll, I'll see what happens. I'll, I'll throw some feelers out there. I'll show them this yeah. shirt. Um, I'm just kidding. But hey, who knows? <laughs> All right, Sway. Well, well this is great. Uh, we got to keep having you back on more. I know you've been out a few months, but um, again, your analytics is top notch uh, compared to what I can bring to the table. But um, let's do it again soon. Yeah, let's do it, man.